Alrighty, we're back for another episode. Very excited today to be joined by Professor Michael Neidig uh, from Oxford University, who, uh, listen, I have no shame. So, you know, I'm definitely one of your, uh, I'm kind of a fanboy because I really love, love your work with, and I work in like iron catalysis. And so you're working, really studying the underlying mechanisms of iron is quite a difficult um, thing to do generally. So later on today, I'm very excited to, you know, pick your brain about um, the work that you guys do in iron uh, catalysis, but also understanding really what's happening at a you know molecular level for iron. But as well as I didn't know you guys actually did also work in F elements, too, so actinides and lanthanides. So um, yeah, I'm, we all have our side hobby projects, and so yeah. ours has been F element electronic structure for for a couple of years. Yeah, I'm uh, so that's something that I've really, I mean, a, a lot of like non chemists might look at the periodic table and. Um, it's like, wow, you guys really know everything about these elements. It's like, no, I don't know anything about the, I really don't know anything about the actinides and lanthanides other than maybe like something about uranium and plutonium, but it's about well, it. I've really. always enjoyed, I've always enjoyed that people will refer to them as the uh, mythical beasts part of the periodic table, which is <laughs> not entirely true. We know more about them than that, but it, but it is probably uh, one of the least well or broadly known areas of, of chemistry. Yeah. So. We'll definitely get into that later today. Uh, but first, I actually also wanted to congratulate you because you just got appointed to Oxford, right? So this is your first. I, I, I you know, I still, uh, um, I assume you're still moving everything over, and uh, so congratulations on that. Um, yeah, no, it, well, it's it's been a it's been a, a really exciting time for myself and for the group. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend to others moving across the Atlantic with their labs. Um, it's it's is much worth work as you think and then probably a bit more but um but we're pretty much up and running now so it, it only took about nine months but yeah uh, i uh it was an endeavor i was gonna say like what i mean moving across in an ocean with the organic you know or inorganic all the instruments really that you guys have and um i mean how were there things that you didn't like know going into it like what was like some of the biggest challenges like moving you know a chemistry lab think, acro across the Atlantic. I think the biggest challenge is finding the right company mm. that specializes in transporting sensitive scientific equipment, whether that be across the U.S. or or on a boat across the Atlantic. You have similar challenges, you know, whether that be vibration, motion, just optics breaking. And so, uh, we're very fortunate in Rochester that there was a there was a very good company who specializes in this, and so we've worked with them. Uh, throughout the process uh, to get things packed up and shipped over. I think the bigger question is, is in these moves is what do you really need that's you know maybe unique or particularly valuable and hard to replace and and what could you actually you know be better served just to buy right, right. once you move and then reintegrate and so balancing that has has been a bit a challenge. But I will say that uh, you know the University of Rochester uh, where I was previously have been you know very supportive. And generous throughout this move, and it, it you know it's fantastic, fantastic place to be a faculty member in inorganic chemistry. I can't think of a better place to start as a young faculty member. But you know we all have dream places to go and work, and, and for me, uh, moving to Oxford was that. So uh, sometimes, oh. sometimes things work out. But yeah, congratulations to you. Then, um, what I, one cool question is like, did you have to kind of? Are you able to? Were you able to move a lot of your chemicals over? I, I can't imagine that, like, uh, you know, basically those F elements had to stay in the United States, basically. Yeah, we we left a, a fair amount of uranium, depleted uranium, in uh, Rochester that my my former colleague Ellen Matson is now making good use of. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no, you're right. With with chemicals, those are not things that you're going to generally ship across uh, the Atlantic. Uh, you're mostly looking at some equipment. You're looking at some supplies. Of course, you still, you know, deal with with all the things with customs and and, and shipping with that, and so it's it's a lot of work. But um, you know, in the end, I think it worked out pretty well. Many things we just bought new on this side, so yeah, um, it's it's kind of a blend. Yeah, so I'm glad it, I'm glad it worked out well, um, and excited to see. Well, you're now you're you know ready to start a your first full year at uh, Oxford, so that will be really really cool and. Excited to see what's what's going to come out this next year. Um, 
And, uh, you know, before we get into, you know, your research now, um, I definitely want to start with kind of your general background so people can get to know you a little bit. Um, I know you did your undergrad at, at uh, Colgate University, which is really dead center of New York, um, New York State, um, which a lot of people don't know. Um, there is much more to New York than New York City and Manhattan. And the state's actually pretty large, mostly uh, trees and forest and farmland, um, which might people, many people might not even know about. Um, so I think Colgate, you know, like I said, it's like dead center. It's about, mm, I don't know, 30 miles southwest of Syracuse, so people know where that is. Um, but I assume you're probably from that area then. I, I kinda, you know, you're probably from the northeast then or? Yeah, so I grew up on a, on a dairy farm in central Pennsylvania. So I grew up actually very close to Penn State University, maybe about 20 miles away. Um, I always like to joke, in a county with two red lights, so that is that is true, actually. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, part of what attracted me to Colgate was the fact that it is actually a very rural campus. And so when you're an 18-year-old yeah. kid and you've never got – the biggest thing you've ever seen is, you know, a McDonald's drive through um, you know, you take it one step at a time. So going to Colgate was, was, was a tremendous, uh, opportunity in that it's a great academic institution. Um, but it's also in, in an environment that at least at that time in my life, I was familiar with. Yeah. I, uh, I actually grew up in Pennsylvania as well. I'm from uh, King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, which is about 20 minutes east of Philadelphia. And so, um, quite, uh, some of my, some of my fondest members like visiting Pittsburgh is driving through Pennsylvania. I mean, there really is, it really is a beautiful state. Um, but it is pretty interesting to see the dichotomy between if you, you know, if you're from the, the Northeast, um, oh, you can't hear me again. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the recording. Alrighty. Hop right back into it. So yeah, so as I was saying, you know, um, I grew up in the Southeast Pennsylvania and driving through, uh, central Pennsylvania, which a lot many people also don't know really exists, um, the vast farmlands, but really the beautiful landscape, I think, and um, the mountain ranges that go through there. And in the fall, it's extremely beautiful, um, all the different colors of the trees. Um, so, um, Yeah, no, I grew, up, I grew up in a county called Juniata County, uh, okay. um, which is basically one of those counties in the middle of the of the Appalachian Mountains, where the county is surrounded on both sides by a chain of mountains, and you live in a valley, basically. So, yeah. yeah. Um, growing up, um, you said you grew up on a, on a dairy farm. Um, I assume you were up early in the morning, uh, taking care of the cows and harvesting, or was it was it the yeah. uh, you, yeah. you milk them twice a day, four in the morning, four in the afternoon, all so that it could go to Hershey chocolate, um, so you can have lots of Hershey kisses. <laughs> very underrated uh park there um hershey park very underrated mm -hmm. um doesn't really doesn't really get the credit that it deserves but if you're from pennsylvania you know hershey park is quite actually a very fun amusement park um generally speaking you know growing up you know um was stem in general or chemistry something that you were always interested in or how you know um how was your kind of your upbringing through through stem and when did your first initial interest come into the to, to, to that field well i th I think I was very fortunate right I went to a very small high school I think there was about ninety students a year um, hmm. and, and that has some limitations with with the types of material you get exposed to but uh, my school happened to have a, a wonderful set of, of science and math teachers at that time um, and so you know it was something I became interested in because of those just outstanding teachers that I had a chance to work with. Uh, coming from a rural area, you go to college thinking that, of course, if you like STEM, you're going to do medicine because you don't know anything else. Um, and then you get to university and you get exposed to all the, you know, really exciting different areas of, of science you can move into. So for me, it was pretty, pretty quick on at, at Colgate. I decided I wanted to do just chemistry. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's really down to the teachers I had. Um, at, at high school that were just really excellent in both chemistry, biology, and math. Yeah. I find that to be true for, I mean, most cases that, you know, having really good teachers at a young level really makes those impressions and for us to kind of continue with that. Um, that's really good to hear. Any, uh, any like favorite hobbies or activities kind of growing up? Um, like some things that you kind of did? Um, well, sports in general. So I, I, you know, played a lot of, 
baseball growing up. That was probably one of my favorite sports through high school. Uh, I played a lot of basketball as well, tennis. Mm. Um, so, you know, when, when I wasn't working on the farm, I was normally in, in some type of a, uh, of a, of a sports team. Um, and so that was a lot of fun growing up. Yeah. Tennis is a very underrated sport. Um, uh, I'm, I'm excited to see, um, how much, uh, cause that, that, that young kid, I forget his name, but he just won the, he just won the Wimbledon. And so, uh, hopefully it starts to pick up steam. Um, I think, um, yeah, very, very fun sport to pick up and play with, uh, with friends tennis. Um, now at Colgate, um, did you do any like undergraduate research there or, um, you know, how yes, did that, yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Okay. So, um, I had two kind of different research stints. So really my first research was at Texas A&M university for a summer. There was a, mm. a former uh, Colgate graduate, uh, who was running a, a biochemistry lab there. And so, um, spent a summer, um, in Texas learning what heat really is. Um, and, and, and doing some research for the summer. Um, and then um, with Peter Sheridan um, at Colgate, I kind of did uh, my, my senior research there on transition metal chemistry. And so uh, he's really the person who got me most excited about inorganic chemistry um, yeah. for the future. How did you get that opportunity to go study at uh, Texas A&M? Like, how did you, how that arrive? Uh, it was just very good luck. Basically, I think it was advertised internally through uh, biology faculty. I knew that this this former alumnus would have this position if there was somebody who, you know, ha really wanted to come down and would be a good match for the position. And so it was probably more by word of mouth. And sometimes, you know, you just need a bit of luck that way. You do. Um, so, so that worked out really, really well. And, um, you know, ultimately, I didn't keep doing biology, but um, it was still a great research experience working with graduate students and postdocs. That was the first time I had done that. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, uh, especially those at uh, that kind of undergrad area, I mean, it's really just about getting your hands, you know, dirty and just getting in the lab and, you know, you really don't, obviously you don't have to know all the answers. It's just a matter of having fun with it and, um, seeing, so it's really cool. You had that opportunity. I remember doing, um, undergraduate research summer of 2019, I think, or maybe it was 2018, it might've been 2018. And. Some of my favorite memories were just like, I'd stay on campus at the dorms and, you know, I'd do chemistry during the weekdays and it was just like super chill. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where I found my passion for chemistry. So, um, for any undergraduates out there. What I remember the most about that summer at A&M is playing basketball with their football team, wow. um, you know, twice a week where I, I'm not a short person, right? I'm over six foot, but I was by far the shortest person on the basketball team. <laughs> um, and so you learn very quickly, oh, you know, pass it to the person that's over two meters tall and just let them, just let them shoot. Yeah. Um, so it, it was, it was a real reminder that yes, I should do science, give up on any sports aspirations. <laughs> You're not really an athlete. So, yeah. Oh man. Uh, well, that's definitely one way, one way of putting it. I listen, I know I also have no real aspirations for, I mean, I, I have a general athleticism, like football, basketball, but I mean, I'm by no means a pro. Um, but, um, definitely, uh, use my, my brain for, uh, for, for chemistry, I think. Um, but after your, um, after your undergraduate degree, you, know, you went on to do, uh, work where I think, I guess a master's degree really, right. At the university of Cambridge. And so, um, how did that opportunity arise? And I assume then that kind of got your initial interest to go do work in England. Right, so obviously now you're you're in Oxford, but I'm wondering if that's kind of where your dream kind of started. In many ways, it is. So I guess I have to take a step back. When I was a junior at, mm. at Colgate, uh, we had a very good study abroad program for science majors to spend a semester at the University of Wales at Cardiff in okay. the UK. And so I had done that when I was a junior. Really enjoyed the experience. It was my first time outside of the United States. Right. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, academic environment. And then going into my senior year, basically I was approached by, you know, some of the, the fellowship people at, the, at Colgate saying, hey, you know, there's this Churchill uh, scholarship uh, competition for science and math. Um, at that point, they had never had anyone win. Um, and, it, and it was, you know, you know, would you be interested? And it's like, well, of course I would be interested, right? And that funded basically doing a master's degree at Cambridge. So I was very 
very fortunate to um, to be able to get that. And so that gave me a chance to go over to, to Cambridge to do some really different chemistry on kind of asymmetric porphyrin syntheses, which I don't recommend to anyone unless you really like columns. Um, I, I've done my life's share of columns. Um, uh, but it was a great experience and you get exposed more to, you know, the unique academic atmosphere at places like Cambridge and Oxford. They are certainly organized differently from U.S. institutions. And mm. and I really enjoyed that. I ended up going back to the U.S. for my Ph.D., but it was a it was a fantastic experience. It really, I think, is motivated me here later in my career to want to, to move back to the U.K. What are, what are some of the biggest draws you think that um, that the English you know, universities kind of have uh, that kind of attracted you to them? Anything like really well, stick I, out? I, I mean, I guess I'd have to say first that, you know, uh, Oxford and Cambridge are structured differently mm. in, in many ways than the other um, UK universities, which would look much more familiar to someone in a US institution. So really mm. it's, it's those two that are quite distinct. Uh, there's a, a large college system uh, within the universities. And so students tend to have a stronger affiliation to their college than to the university. It's, you know, I, I joke with my, my students, it's like Harry Potter, but instead of four houses, there's like 38 of them or something <laughs> like that. Um, but it, it's the fact that you have these, these smaller academic units where you have people from all different disciplines um, mm. that interact. So every day at lunch, I, I, I'll sit next to someone from physics or biology or, or law or history and, you know, it's it's a really a stimulating academic environment beyond what you already get in in the chemistry department. So yeah. um, that's something that I think is is quite distinctive of of a place like Oxford. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting um, because I, I definitely can hear that. I know, like, I mean, I've only really been to University of Houston as a grad student. I've really been anywhere yet, um, and it's you know, we're a large university. I mean, we have sixty thousand undergrads, something like that. So it's like hard to, you know interdisciplinary stuff are hard to come by. I mean, and it's not that it's not, it's obviously not that I think that many faculty aren't opposed to it. It's just like, practically speaking, um, you know, you kind of, you get wrapped up in your own world, I think. So um, well, there's no mechanism for it. Right. So, you know, yeah. here with college system, there's a mechanism where we meet for lunches, college meetings, social events, uh, where we're, we're all going to get together. There's only really three chemistry faculty in, in the college that I'm in. Wow, um, and that's one of you know, there there are many in the department. Mm. Um, whereas you know, when I when I was you know a student in the U.S. or faculty in the U.S., there was just no mechanism for these yeah. types of interactions. We were all in separate buildings. We would very rarely interact. Mm. Um, so yeah, no, it's it it, it kind of makes it special. Yeah, I hear that. That's really that's really cool. That you're you're able to do those things, um, but it was the move to from your master's to a phd kind of a natural progression um and how did you decide to go to uh, stanford um and then yeah, what so well, of... it was so it was one of those where i had actually uh, applied to phd programs uh, my senior year before i went to cambridge so i had actually gone through the whole process of visiting and deciding on school so so i had basically deferred at stanford um so i knew that after cambridge i was going to go back to stanford mm. um what took me there was, um, you know, I had done a lot of biology and biochemistry research as an undergrad, as well as inorganic chemistry. And so at that point, you know, it, you know, I was very much struggling to decide, well, what direction do I want to go in? Mm. And, you know, you start to learn of this wonderful field of bioinorganic chemistry. And you're like, oh, wait, I can combine the two. I don't have to choose. A big, uh, big and, brain and play. So, and so, uh, so Ed Solomon. Uh, who's a wonderful uh, bioinorganic chemist there at Stanford, uh, was someone whose research at the time I just found very attractive, combining you know, detailed spectroscopic studies of, of the teleprotein active sites. Um, and, you know, I thought he had a, a lab which had a really strong intellectual environment. Um, it seemed like a very supportive environment for doing doing research. And, and so, you know, I just... You know, after visiting, decided okay, this is where I I want to do my PhD, and and so that's what led me to Stanford. I'm sure the weather helped out. I mean, being in England and kind of central well, PA, I'm sure well, it helped be in Stanford. I've never been to California. I've never been to California, so 
Stanford's campus gets you right away. They have this palm drive that leads up to the Memorial Church where both sides are just palm trees as far as you can see. Uh, for a farm kid from Pennsylvania, that is quite a sight. Um, so <laughs> it, it, it is, it is a, a beautiful campus and the facilities are world class there. Um, so I, you know, I really enjoyed my time there. It was not hard to say yes um, to study. That's that's very fair. What was um so in particular, you know, what were you studying at at, uh, at Stanford? Like, what was kind of like? I know you, you mentioned like transition metal um, um, metals in uh, biological systems and using spectroscopy, but like, what specifically were you working on? Well, it won't surprise you to learn it was iron. So my PhD oh, well. research was studying non-heme iron enzymes, particularly those with uh, alpha ketoglutarate cofactors to do a lot of oxygen activation reactions for CH hydroxylation or ring closure, desaturation type systems. And so uh, my PhD was focused on trying to understand what were the active site structures, what were mm. the mechanistic steps involved in substrate binding, cofactor binding, oxygen activation, looking for reduced oxygen or iron oxygen intermediates and transformations, things like that. And so um, that, that was my, my PhD. Any general like takeaways at your time there? For, like any like key understandings about that, or was well, it? I think I think you know one of the, the the key understandings was was focused on how enzymes that look fundamentally the same they use mm. the same cofactors they have very similar uh, metal sites lead to significant differences in site selective chemistry. And so the interplay between second sphere interactions yep. and first coordination sphere uh, reactivity um, and how that is defined in different classes of alpha KGs was a, was a big aspect of what we did, including how, you know, uh, you would lead to uh, hydroxylation versus chlorination activity. Uh, again, with, with active sites, it looked very, very similar, at least from, from crystallography. Yeah, enzymes are... I mean, I would never, it seems like a very difficult area of study, but it, I mean, it is pretty crazy how selective enzymes can be. I mean, um, you know, if you have a, you know, um, a compound, uh, let's say you're even from like a pharmaceutical drug, whatever that you intake and, uh, you know, that has, I don't know, 40 some carbons, some enzymes can just selectively oxidize one of the carbons or, you know, whatever. It's just, it's just really the interplay there is, is super fascinating to me. Um, practically speaking, you know, how do you like do this? Like, how do you study, let's say biological, how do you study iron in, in like these, these, these types of systems? Well, first you find a really nice collaborator who's willing to spend uh, weeks making you enzyme. Um, <laughs> because you need a, a fairly high concentration. So, you know, um, we would use a lot of, of advanced spectroscopies that were targeted either specifically uh, to iron or to, to more generally paramagnetic centers. And so mm. we use a lot of what's called magnetic circular dichroism spectroscopy. Um, I mean, it, it's more complicated, but um, uh, basically it's, it's circular dichroism uh, applied with uh, combined with a strong applied magnetic field, so it leads to all kinds of cool uh, changes in, in selection rules, lots of spin orbit effects. But it allows you to to focus in on just the electronic transitions of the iron, which in a sea of protein transitions is 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 actually what makes those studies very challenging. Um, mm. We would use uh, electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy as well. Um, the group would use resonance trauma and X ray absorption. Uh, various techniques that would be able to focus in on the local iron site um, and changes in the local iron site and what is effectively a giant organic ligand uh, for the protein, right? Uh, and so, um, but to do those studies, you needed millimolar concentrations of protein in many cases, and that is a lot of protein um, yeah. if you haven't done it. And so I think the greatest fear you had as a grad student was, please don't kill this sample. Um, because right. I don't want to have to write the email explaining to someone that the sample dump. Oh boy. <laughs> so that was always the challenge is you got very little sample and you had to make it work. Right. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, that's, that, that, that does not sound like a challenge I'd, I would like to really take on. Um, I, I'll gladly leave that to, to other people. Um, but following your, uh, 
following your PhD, you know, I know you um, did some industry work actually with Dow. Um, and even at the, um, you also did a postdoctoral fellowship at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And so, um, you know, how did that opportunity arise? I mean, you know, you really, I guess you really wanted to go right into the, the job market or? Well, it was, you know, I spent my, my PhD doing these exceptionally detailed fundamental studies, right? Of mm -hmm. electronic structure, bonding, reactivity, and metalloprotein active sites. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. But I think at that point in my career, I, I, I was very much interested in trying to doing something more applied, right? Something um, in more of the applied catalysis. And so, uh, you know, Dow had this, this wonderful recruiting program on campus at Stanford, got a chance to talk to some of their scientists. And, you know, there was interest um, in, you know, bringing operando spectroscopic techniques to some of the challenges they were looking at in heterogeneous catalysis. Um, and so it just seemed at the time like this just wonderful opportunity um, mm. to take some of the aspects of catalysis I was interested in, but now to start to to study, you know, systems that, you know, for lack of a better phrase, are, are actually going to make a, a, a difference uh, quite quickly in the daily lives of, of people. And so, um, so yeah, so I got a chance to go uh, to, to Midland to work in, in core chemistry and catalysis. Um, great experience. You work with, you know, I think people in industry are, are, from my experience, are some of the best chemists I've ever worked with. It's, their, mm. their skills are tremendous. Um, uh, the problems they're tackling are incredibly difficult um, because of the limitations they have in terms of cost and material and uh, solution space. And so it, it was a great experience. It's actually a big part of why we do what we do today. Um, yeah. you know, I've switched more to organometallic chemistry and catalysis. Um, and that's because, you know, you know we worked in, in these types of fundamental catalytic problems at, at Dow. Ultimately, uh, I, I think being there also taught me what part of chemistry I most enjoy, which is definitely the how and why aspects mm -hmm. of this. Um, those are not easy to uh, patent, right? Um, and and so, the game. Um, and so, you know, I, it, it just became obvious that as much as I enjoyed my time there and how much I had learned, you know, to kind of pursue the the scientific questions I was most interested in, I would be much better off in an academic environment. And so um, going straight from industry to a faculty position is almost unheard of. Mm. Certainly it's very challenging. Um, and so I took the opportunity to, to go through Los Alamos as a postdoc. It was a great way to work on a completely different problem, which was a DNA templated silver nanocluster synthesis. What is that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was for fluorescent probes um, okay. and also a little bit on, on iron-based uh, oxygen reduction catalysts for fuel cells. Okay. And so, um, but it was a great way to, to go through and I think uh, put myself in a better position for academic jobs that, you know, I was actually serious about this. I wasn't just a slightly unhappy industrial chemist who was poking around for job opportunities. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so, yeah, so I'm, I would say I, I end up on a lot of career discussion panels. Uh, because of my career path, it is it is fairly unusual, I would say, for academics. It's not necessarily. I get asked a lot by young young um, students. Oh, you know, is is this a good idea for academic jobs to do what you did and go to industry? And I always say no, right? I, I think it's great for idea generation. I think it's great for coming up with new scientific problems. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to get academic jobs in chemistry, um, and it's even harder when you take non traditional paths. Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, f what, for better or for worse, it definitely is, uh, um, academic jobs are, I mean, they're really competitive. I mean, you really are competing against, you know, some of the best, uh, chemists, right? Uh, so those are, those are definitely, um, extremely competitive jobs. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's, I, I think you kind of said it, I mean, in the industry, you know, you really do work with a, a lot of great, um, people. Um, but, you really, I mean, my impression is, again, I'm only going to be a graduate for two and a half years, um, but my impression is that you don't really get a chance to understand the underlying, you know, mechanisms at a fundamental level. It's, most of the time, it's very applicable um, and the applications of it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I'm wrong on that, but that's just my impression of it. Um, I think that, I mean, I think it's fair to say that 
the, the timelines in, in industry are very short compared to what one might experience as a graduate student. You know, to have a project where they're, you know, go, no go decisions six months in, a year in, maybe less is exceptionally mm. common. And so I, I think because of that, right, you, one is trying to push forward, okay, can we, can we get catalytic hits here that make sense, right? Do we see a path forward to generating a process that not only is effective, but is, is makes sense from a financial standpoint? Mm -hmm. um, and if the answer is yes, then, then you can have opportunities for more detailed studies, right, as the program extends. But, but I, I think if it's obvious that a system just isn't going to work, to the level that's required, um, it, it's hard to justify putting in all the resources to the detailed mechanistic studies. And I mean, that's part of why, again, why why I decided academics made more sense to me because I like you would have these systems with very unusual behavior, and and your inherent curiosity was was to say, well, why is this possible? How does this work? Uh, but you know, that's not something you're going to follow up on a system that you're never going to pursue and so commercial. Yeah. So. So it's, there's lots of really interesting science there that I think ends up just, you know, getting passed on. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Just on the shelf, just waiting to be, waiting to be, uh, let's say learned, learned about, but, um, this kind of, this kind of a good transition, I think, into what you work on now. Um, this is some that, you know, like I said before, I definitely follow really closely and you guys do a lot of really understanding the under the underlying mechanisms of iron and a lot of, um, catalytic reactions. Um, and so I guess the first thing is, I, and this is something that, that I really want to hear your philosophy on. Um, I think from a chemistry point of view, trying to understand, well, all right, let's take, I'm going to take a step back for a second. Iron is a very attractive metal to do catalytic reactions um, for many reasons. One is, it's, I think it's the most abundant metal on Earth's crust. I mean, um, so it's just, this is a plethora of it available um and it's extremely easy i guess to mine too so it's really easy to get out um uh, uh, compared to let's say other metals um i don't know if you were going to say something there but i was gonna say you can always get a rusted down car too but mm. yes there's, there's so, a lot of particularly iron oxide work. yeah uh so it you know it's extremely abundant um you know it's a the most abundant metal um and also, too, I mean, um, from a, I mean, really even from a health standpoint, I guess, you know, if you definitely want to make the argument that there's some merits to it, you know, you could more or less eat like iron salts and you know, you'll be fine. Um, I don't know. I definitely don't recommend that, but I mean, yeah. I'm just. Yeah. We should be careful. There's a limit to everything, but yes, you're yeah. right. That I think the, the, um, uh, the toximity limit on iron is, is quite substantial. Yeah. Um, and I think. And the obvious question is, and, and and the other thing is too, is like Kumata coupling, right, has been known for, I mean, basically 100 years at this point. I mean, it's been known, simple iron salts, green reagents, and aryl chlorides will couple. Um, that's been known for so long. Um, but um, it kind of got phased out during the 70s and 80s, and again, replaced with palladium to do these types of reactions. And... Uh, you know, palladium works really well and it's no, you know, it's no reason why it's, uh, you know, won the Nobel prize in 2010. Um, um, you know, we could sit here and argue who deserved that Nobel prize, but the point is that palladium is very good at, at cross couplings and, and medicinal chemistry. Um, but that kind of brings me up to now. I think it's still very attractive to do chemistry with iron. Um, but there's a lot of challenges with it. Um, namely it's very hard to, understand the under underlying mechanisms. I definitely want to, this is definitely something that you'll be able to kind of touch on is that palladium is very well understood at this point. I mean, there's basically nothing that we don't know about palladium in a, a cross coupling sense, but there's a lot that we still don't know about iron and it's just difficult to study. And so I guess my first question is, you know, why, you know, what makes iron difficult to study? Let's say in a, a specifically kind of cross coupling, uh, manifold um compared to other metals well i, I think you know the, the first challenge i always tell tell the students when they join my group about iron that makes it hard is the the large available uh number of oxidation and spin states right so if you're doing you know 
typical palladium couplings, you're mostly worried about palladium zero, palladium two. They're both going to be diamagnetic, right? Um, in iron, it becomes much more more ambiguous because if you sit, take a simple iron salt and you trade it with a Grignard reagent, uh, it will reduce in most cases the whole weight to metal, right? And so now it's well, I have iron three, I have iron two, I have maybe iron one, iron zero. Each of those has multiple spin states. Many of them are paramagnetic. Mm. Uh, and so, so just the sheer abundance of oxidation and spin states you have to deal with is going to make the problem more challenging, right? Um, you know, I think palladium has certainly benefited tremendously uh, also from the fact that the organopalladium intermediates that you form uh, are relatively stable. You can often crystallize those at room temperature. They also tend to be diamagnetic and, and maybe a little bit easier to manipulate for stoichiometric reactions. Um, from our experience, organo iron intermediates are anything but stable. Uh, um, they yep. tend to be very thermally unstable, obviously very sensitive to oxygen and protons. Um, and then I, I think the third thing that often gets lost is just a, a kinetic sense in that, you know, your typical palladium cross-coupling reaction, or even nickel, you might end up heating this, letting the reaction run for hours overnight. Uh, some of the, the original um, iron commodity cross couplings by Kochi are basically done in, in 10 minutes at zero degrees, right? And so you're clearly dealing with very unstable, very reactive intermediates that, that, that maybe don't have to live for very long in solution, to be completely honest, right? Mm. Uh, and, and so you have that combina the challenge as well, that even if you can do the spectroscopy, uh, structurally characterizing the intermediates is going to take some, you know, non-standard approaches to to manipulating samples at low temperature, uh, and so I think all of that makes it makes it hard. And I think, I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, it, it, that makes it hard to be be, you know, um, hypothesis driven, um, fundamental driven in terms of methods development. Uh, certainly, you know, if I was I was a young organic chemist, it it must be intimidating to say, well, I will propose to do all this beautiful iron chemistry for my academic job um, because there's not a lot, not still not a lot of foundational science there, and and it may work beautifully, and it may be an absolute disaster, um, and and so I think that this, this is a challenge for the field. Um, Certainly in the commodities as well, what I will say is from our own work, they don't behave like play, right? Mm. You have different oxidation states involved. You have different reaction pathways involved. Um, you tend not to have any type of oxidative addition, at least with, 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 with a lot of alkyl electrophiles. Um, and so it's fundamentally different in terms of the elementary steps. And so um, I think historically, a lot of the iron cross couplings were, were were basically developed by people taking palladium or nickel systems and then trying out different metal salts. Um, and, and some of them work. You know, some of them work very, very well. But I think if, if we truly want to make these reactions work well, we need to know how, what iron species are involved, what are the fundamental catalytic steps, and then hopefully use that to make bespoke iron ligands, right, that take advantage of the unique structures and reactivities of iron as opposed to um, simply um, trying to mimic right, ligands and structures from palladium or, or, or nickel chemistry. I think that's been the biggest challenge in the field. And and I still don't think we're to the place where we can do that broadly, but I think that that has to be the goal. Yeah, I think, and for all the reasons that you just mentioned, you know, in an academic sense, these challenges are sound really good. I mean, this the, these sorts of challenges are personally what excite me about doing iron chemistry um, that we do. Um, but something I really want to pick your brain about is like for all those challenges, right? Um, mm -hmm. From a chemistry point of view is super attractive, right? Those mm -hmm. trying to figure out those things. But at the same time, it's like, <laughs> it doesn't really sound too good. Let's say for funding and grants. Now, now look, maybe it's not, maybe the, you know, maybe I have the wrong thinking on this, but like it, and I kind of want to, you know, hear your thoughts on this. Let's say for, especially in a medicinal sense and pharmaceutical sense, you know, because palladium is so well understood, um, why would we switch to iron where so much is not understood? Um, you know, 
what are the kind of, yeah, I don't know if you have any like general thoughts on that. Well, yeah, normally when I give a, you know, when I give a, a research presentation, um, I'll normally acknowledge, okay, yes, there's a lot of motivation to look at metals like iron because they're cheap, they're sustainable, uh, they have low toxicity, right? If you could make every reaction that works with palladium today uh, work with iron tomorrow, of course, people will run them with iron, right? But I think I think what really, really inspires us is... Well, first, you're never going to get every reaction that works with palladium to work with iron. That's just probably not realistic. But also, iron isn't palladium, right? It's going to do differential transformations. It's going to be able to do new types of reactions, such as, you know, we've done three-component radical couplings with, with my good friend Osvaldo Gutierrez. That's not something you're going to do with palladium, right? Um, and so I think that that beyond just the motivation of cheaper, more sustainable catalysis, moving into organo iron chemistry is going to open up new reaction paradigms, new classes of transformations um, that can br more broadly contribute to the organic chemist toolbox for bond constructions, for uh, pharmaceuticals and fine chemicals. And so I think long-term that might be the bigger impact of iron chemistry, mm -hmm. the fact that it's not palladium. Um, and so for, for me, I think that's a big motivating factor as well for looking into this fundamental chemistry is, is finding new transformations that, that perhaps you couldn't do. Yeah. And maybe, maybe this is something that I'm still kind of, I kind of think out loud and I haven't really thought this all the way through. It's like, maybe it's not a, it's uh, the obvious comparison to do like iron catalysis is to look at palladium, but like you mentioned that it, it might not be the best way to look at it, right? Uh, they just, they're just different systems. So perhaps not trying to force the elementary steps of palladium onto iron and, you know, and even things like aryl chlorides, which are traditionally sluggish for palladium are actually worked really good for iron. And I don't really know why that is yet, but, um, that is traditionally, um, that to be true though. And, uh, I think, yeah, I think there is a lot of opportunity in iron. I also think another, another, um, thing I was thinking about is, there's a lot of talk of like plate um iron is a very abundant metal and it is very cheap but on the flip side it's like if you want to do mass production cross coupling with palladium you only need like one mole percent like it's not even like it's not even like you're using a lot of palladium anyways so i don't know i don't know your general your, your general thoughts on that um, on that criticism well, i mean the first the first thing i would say with iron is iron is cheap but yeah. if you put a ferrari costing ligand on it it's not that's right. true. Often, often the ligand costs dominate even the metal costs, even often for palladium chemistry. And so, um, you know, if you're going to use metals like iron as low cost replacements, you're going to need simple systems that require simple ligands um, that are easy to handle um, and, and, and don't involve, you know, high end ligand design. Mm. Um, in terms of, of, of palladium, yeah, certainly one approach in, in, in that field is to keep dropping the loadings to the point where cost becomes less of an issue. I mean, there's there's always still some some challenges with, with certain precious metals in terms of where they're mined, right, and access to them depending on the geopolitical climate. Um, and then, of course, there are different levels of, of um of metal contaminants that are allowed in, in drugs. So for example, even at low palladium loadings, you're still gonna have to spend some some cost and some effort in making sure that any residual palladium is below the acceptable leg limit for, for example, EU. Um, and for iron, of course, that, that may not be as challenging to do. Mm. Um, but you know, I, I think there there are many ways to to approach these problems, right? I'm I'm my focus is on iron because you know, that's the area that I'm excited about. Um, you know, I think I often think of it as, you know, people will ask me, well, why don't we do more maybe nickel or, or cobalt catalysis? And, and the first thing I would say is there's, well, first, other outstanding people in the world doing that already. I don't think they, they, they need us being part of it. But secondly, at the end of the day, I, I, I do think that, that iron is, is, is perhaps the ultimate transition metal for catalysis. And if we can make it work with iron, no one's going to care if the cobalt reaction. Right. Yeah. And so, um, and so that's why we, even though it's a very challenging problem, um, and it's a long way from any type of solution that that's why we've, we've decided to focus our efforts there. 
um, where we think we can make a, a unique contribution. Uh, but but there, you know, in terms of catalysis development, I think it's you know I think taking all these different approaches is, is very reasonable to trying to solve these chemical problems. Yeah, I think I, I this is not necessarily a, a chemistry argument, but you know I do know like I mean everyone knows where cobalt is mined it's in in the, in the Congo, um, and people seen the working conditions of, of mining the cobalt. Um, really, I mean if people if you don't know about cobalt mining. Um, and to be fair, though, a lot of the cobalt and palladium is really using kind of batteries, not necessarily using catalytic reactions um, yeah. in medicinal chemistry. To, and, you know, to, to be fair, um, um, I know palladium is sourced from uh, we get our palladium sources from South Africa and Russia here in the United States. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'll let people make their own decisions of, you know, how we source our palladium. If you want it to be from Russia, um, I'm not going to uh, put my opinion on that. Um, I, we could source these metals here in the United States, but we have such high regulations that, you know, is what it is. And iron is just extremely attractive for that reason. Um, but I guess taking a step back for a minute, you know, I know you worked in looking at iron in biological systems, but, um, you know, when you became an assistant professor at Rochester, you know, what was like kind of those initial interests, like where, and how did you even know, like, really kind of where to start, you know, analyzing um, these these iron systems? Well, so where I was interested originally, it was actually something that came out of inspiration from doing heterogeneous catalysis at Dow, right? Often, heterogeneous catalysts are often developed by, you know, sometimes complex mixtures, multiple impregnations of various metals and additives on very specific substrates. And, you know, you'll screen a lot of these and you find one that works. and often often even to today people don't know how right and so when i when i i took that and said okay i don't want to do heterogeneous catalysis this is just terribly challenging <laughs> uh, but if you take that and, and you you translate that to homogeneous catalysis you would you know you to me there there are kind of two approaches to making homogeneous catalysis so one is what I, I like to call the inorganic approach i come from which is okay i'm going to design myself a really nice ligand right i'm going to make a complex I'm going to get a nice crystal structure of it. Of course, it has to be stable enough, right, that I can do all of these things. All right. And I will characterize it, and then I'll, I'll feed it some substrates. And if they don't work, I'll feed it some other substrates. And if it doesn't work, I'll start to heat it up. Um, what I find an analogy to, to HeadCat is, is the organic chemist approach to metal catalyst design in some cases, where there are all these iron reactions, and there are other metals, this is true too, where they just... You know, here's an iron salt. We'll just add this co-solvent. Here's a little bit of base. Uh, put in a miracle TMEDA additive, and it works, <laughs> right? And you know, there's no doubt catalytically these reactions work, just like the HECAT one. But there's that same black box of understanding of well, what are you making in situ, and so that was very attractive to me starting out because first. Um, there was a very good chance this was going to be new organometallic and coordination chemistry, right? If you're generating something in situ that does a reaction and none of the model compounds do, likely what's doing the chemistry doesn't look like the model compound, um, at least not exactly. And then secondly, um, it's an interesting way to figure out catalyst design. Instead of trying to make a catalyst and find out what works, you're basically taking systems that they work catalytically. There's no doubt they make products. It's just a question of, in order to improve them, understanding how they work and what makes them distinct. Um, and so we found those to be very interesting challenges in, in many different types of transformations, not just cross-coupling, um, mm. CA functionalization, alkene functionalization. There, there are a broad set of reactions with iron, with cobalt as well, to be honest, uh, where, where, where systems work that are kind of, you know, a former colleague would have said a witch's brew right uh, of materials and um we thought with the type of spectroscopies we had and the engineering approaches we could take to to transient intermediates maybe this was something we could tackle and uh, it's not easy but it's it's fun so. yeah maybe we could touch on um some things that you've you've found because i know that uh things like tetramethylethylene diamine so tometa and things like uh N methyl pyrrolidinone, so NMP, like you mentioned, they, they seem to work in in cross coupling fashions. But you know what 
you know, um, I don't know if you want to break down a little bit and something that you found, like why these additives work and what's the kind of general consensus. I know work by Professor Ilo Fershner, at Max Planck, who's really studied this since 2002, I think, honestly, he's been on this for a while now. And so, you know, what, you know, you know, what seems to be the general consensus of why those additives work? Yeah, well, first, I should say, Firstner is just an absolute leader in the field, and it's been a real inspiration to, to me in my career since I started out uh, with some of the systems he's developed. Uh, Masaharu Nakamura in Japan as well. Um, mm. um, you know, these are, I'll take them separately. So the NMP system, there's a whole, we found that there's a whole class of organoferrate catalysts that are involved in cross couplings when you don't have any well-defined supporting ligands added to the system. So if you just simply have a, a simple iron salt and a, let's say a Grignard reagent, um, you can access multi-metallic organometallic iron clusters, uh, whether that be with methyls, ethyls, phenols, you know, it, let's say a great time expense to my graduate students, we've managed to, to crystallize and isolate most. Um, you can also have mononuclear species. Um, and so additives such as NMP, we've been able to find basically manipulate the cations in these systems. And in turn, since these are all charged ferrates, the nature of the cation has a big effect over which particular ferrate is thermodynamically preferred in solution, mm. um, as well as some of the kinetics of their, their reduction pathways. And so, so an additive like that is basically taking what is a, a sea of possible ferrates and shifting it to one particular compound being favored in solution. Okay. TM TMEDA or, or Tamita is a bit more complicated, we found. Um, you know, obviously, as an inorganic chemist, you look at that, you go, nice bidentate uh, nitrogen ligand, which, of course, it is to iron. Um, and, in, and in some cross-coupling systems, uh, it depends on the nucleophile, right? It can either get knocked off of iron completely with something strong like a mesotheal gridiron, and Robin Bedford at Bristol's done some beautiful chemistry on that. Um, or with, with weaker nucleophiles, you have these TMEDA ligated intermediates that are, are central to cross-coupling. On a different side, if you look at alkene functionalization, um, TMEDA is often added together with beta hydrogen containing Grignard reagents. Um, and we were able to show that, that that helps to control the reduction of iron to iron zero. So you could make these very unusual iron zero, you know, uh, styrene complexes that are very effective for, you know, hydromagnesiation catalysis. So in that case, the TMEDA is simply coordinating to iron to modulate the kinetics of reduction so it doesn't just all turn into iron metal and, and crash down the solution. And so I think that that's a great example of how these additives don't necessarily have the same role, right, in all of the, the catalytic applications that they're used for. Uh, we do think that there are classes of these that, that they fall into in terms of what they do. Um, but um, I would say certainly the, the propensity of, of some of these clusters was unheard of, you know, in cross-coupling before we found it, and, and NMP modulating it um, was was not the, the running conclusion at the time or the running hypothesis. And, and for TMEDA, uh, the reduction one, I mean, that even surprised us. Uh, but, you know, it's a very clear effect, and it actually helps us, and I hopefully others, think of, of new ways to generate reactive iron zeros. Right, that don't involve just putting a giant pi acceptor ligand. Yeah, I another question I want to pick your brain about is I don't know your general um, thoughts on the uh, let's say the counter anion in these uh, in these catalytic reactions. I know uh, Professor Robin Bedford has shown that you know you can cross couple you can Suzuki couple um, uh, uh, aryl chlorides and uh, a boron reagent uh, using um, some iron salts and an activated borate, but interest, interestingly, they those borates will only couple to aryl chlorides, and I think there are also examples of like tosylates. I think they're able to couple, but they don't work for aryl bromides, which is quite an interesting um, thing because aryl bromides are the easiest to couple for palladium species and, and other metals, but it doesn't seem to work for iron. So I don't know, um, you know, if you know anything about like. The, the the nature of the anion in these 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 coupling manifolds. Yeah, I mean, there's always there's always the potential it has an effect. I think 
you know, with those types of, of cross couplings with with arrow electrophiles, I um, mean, you've got you know Robin's beautiful Suzuki. Nakamura has a kind of a of, of a of a similar uh, system for arrow arrow cross couplings with mm. NHCs. Um, I think there's there's a few challenges there. I think first, those are probably some of the most poorly understood systems steel in, in iron cross coupling in terms of what are the active species uh, that are involved. And, and I will say that, you know, without any evidence, but there's no reason to believe that all iron cross couplings have to go through the same mechanism, right? So, you know, we've certainly looked at a lot of reactions that we know go through these kind of two, three, two, three, one radical couplings. Um, but there's nothing to say that with a reduced iron species in a narrow halide, you wouldn't go through an oxidative addition path. And yep. so, um, you know, I, I think until we understand those systems better and how similar or perhaps how distinct they are, in fact, from the ones we've already studied, it becomes a challenging, challenging question. What's the role of, you know, the anion? It could be that, that you know, the, the, the compounds themselves are cationic. It could be that the, the anions are intersphere, right? Um, you know, that... That I think is still, you know, are they mononuclear compounds? Are they multinuclear compounds? I think there's lots of, of interesting questions with those. The one thing that is true is they almost all work with NHC ligands, which is a bit distinct. Mm -hmm. um, and in an area that really is, is still not as well understood as, let's say, the phosphine system. Or even yeah. ligand free system. Yeah, another, another uh, um, area of research of yours that I want to pick your brain out, because I actually had Professor Osvaldo Gutierrez on the podcast a few months ago. Um, and that was really fun to talk about. And we had uh, talked about uh, those radical cascade couplings you guys had done. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, what, um, how did that project kind of come about? Um, I know that was eventually got published to science, which is really cool to see. And um, it was multi-component. And so, um, which is not a, um, let's say traditional, um, I mean, having, uh, you know, more than two, let's say, um, more than two coupling partners is, is quite a difficult task. So, you know, how did that uh, project um, come about? And, um, you know, how did you get involved with that? Yeah, so, I mean, I've, I I would say Oswald and I had the pleasure of knowing each other already. Um, yes, from, we traveled in similar circles for conferences and so on. And, um, you know, as his group was developing that project, basically, um, you know, we were talking and it made sense to kind of team up on the project. Um, there was a new type of, of couplings. There were some very interesting phosphine ligand effects in their system as well, which weren't immediately obvious. Um, and so uh, we got involved with a lot of the, the, the mechanistic studies, um, phosphine studies, which we could make sense of in the end. Um, and, and it was really, I mean, it's really the way these types of studies should be done, right? Um, mm. I think far too often um, method development is done and then, you know, a spectroscopy comes in as kind of a, a post-mortem afterwards. Um, you know, I, I, I enjoyed much more the projects like with uh, Isvaldo. I've had projects like this with Steve Thomas in Edinburgh where you're kind of doing both in parallel. So you can, you can feed back the, the outcomes of spectroscopy into reaction development, ligand development in, in real time. And I think... I think for challenging uh, base metal systems, that really is the path forward, right? And you know, I think um, they're 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 difficult problems to solve. They're certainly difficult problems if you have no idea what's going on with your your metal speciation. And so, uh, it was just a great opportunity for us to work together on this this really interesting system. And you know, we're, we're still working together on. Other variants of it. Uh, I know one of his students is coming to spend a couple months with us here in, in Oxford. So um, um, I'm, I'm excited to keep working with Osvaldo. He's got lots of great synthetic ideas, really cool systems um, that kind of push the limit of, of what we do as well. Um, and, and I think synergistically, the, you know, we've had a, a really good run working together and it, it'll continue. I'm very, I'm very excited to see the, the future work out of that project. Um, what were what were some of the let's say uh, mechanistically and and, and uh, specifically towards the iron center? Like, what were some of the key takeaways from these radical these radical cascade couplings? Like, what what were some of the big takeaways from the as far as like the iron center goes? Yeah, well, I think the first thing that came out of that study is the fact that um, 
you need a lot of iron two in solution, particularly mm. aero iron two. And so very much like the, the two component cross couplings we've looked at, uh, one of the key steps is that you generate uh, a radical from your electrophile, which then normally recombines with an aero iron two bisphosphine to generate transiently an iron three that would then reductively eliminate to make your 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 carbon carbon bond or at least one of them. And so uh, I think the first useful lesson was that actually the three components weren't that much different, right? That that they use this kind of similar uh, process by which you would transmetallate and have an iron two. You would eventually generate an, an electrophile radical that would then recombine with an alkene to generate a new radical that would recombine with the iron. So you were you're trapping that initial radical in solution. Uh, but what came out of it with the phosphines was catalysis doesn't go through reducing iron. I think it's one of the big misnomers in 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 still in iron cross coupling is well I need to make an iron one or I need to make an iron zero. Um, actually, what happens in the three component is you make an iron two, an organo iron two, and that is exceptionally reactive towards electrophile. So you need a, a coordinatively unsaturated organo iron two, and that will kick off catalysis. If your phosphine is too small, you make a six coordinate catalyst and you're dead. Mm. And so, so, so just the difference between a, a cyclohexyl phosphine and an ethyl uh, bisphosphine was enough sterically to shut down catalysis. So the ethyl makes a, an octahedron, a two to one complex in the second mm. one tetrahedron. Um, and so that, that was also, I think, as something, something reinforcing the role of these organo iron twos, but also I think demonstrating the fine line in your ligand selection, that you need something that, that is reactive, but within a very, I think, well-defined stereo profile. Um, uh, the intermediates, very similar to two two component cross coupling. So I think for me, one of the more interesting things was that you could take some of the, the fundamental concepts in terms of catalyst design and mechanism that you learned from two component couplings, and you could simply extend those to three component coupling in order to to, to push these transformations forward. And and you know I think that kind of design principle with with the radical pathways will continue to work. Um, mm -hmm. Now, are, are bisphosphines the, the ultimate solution in ligands? Well, I think that's an open question. They clearly work, right? Yeah, but, um, and they're not—they're not exactly really complicated ligands either. I mean, they're pretty accessible too, so that's that's quite nice. But but unfortunately, with iron with bisphosphines, you're always fighting over reduction, mm. which is why if you look at it carefully at a lot of the protocols, you'll see slow nucleophile addition with the syringe pump, right? Things like this—they're all designed so you don't make iron metal. Right. Okay. Um, so it's, it's it's like iron zero. Like how do you like what does that mean specifically? Like iron iron zero, iron negative one. I don't know minus one. Iron zero. They tend to stop okay. at iron zero. Okay. Um, and then what will happen once you get to iron zero? They'll re-react with electrophile to reoxidize the iron, uh, but they generate radicals in such a way that there's not the appropriate iron compound around to productively recombine with, and so you just okay. make. A a lot of, you chew through all your electrophile and you make no problem. Okay. Um, on, on this, you know, I, a question that I also want to pick your brain about is how, like, what sort of instrumentation do you guys use to do this stuff? I know you guys use, I know EPR is FA1 and uh, MOS power spectroscopy is another one. Um, and, you know, I would, I have no idea how either instruments work. I've never worked with either of them. So I'd love to hear, like, you know, what, you know, what is required to study these types of systems and like how, how do you do it practically, right? Do you just take a reaction and just put them in the moss and put them in the instrument? Like, I don't know how it works. Well, the first, the first challenge, if we're going to look at an iron reaction is one has to assume that there's the potential for both diamagnetic, paramagnetic species, a variety of spin states. And so that, that immediately creates challenges with more traditional characterization methods. So you can use NMR and we'll use NMR. Uh, but often, if we don't have a large supporting ligand with protons very far away, the paramagnetic signals are, are challenging to observe or even more challenging to interpret. Um, if we're going to do EPR spectroscopy, so you're looking at, at um, you know, unpaired electrons and transitions between various M sub S levels, but there, there are rules there as well. So not everything that's paramagnetic is going to show up in an EPR experiment necessarily. Certainly not once with integer spins. Um, 
just and on so, just on just on EPR real quick. How does that instrument work? I know it's I know it's based on electron spin, not nuclear spin, like an NMR. But you know, I, I look at the spectra. I just see like two singlets. So like, what what is this like? You know, like what is it kind of? Yeah, the spectra always look weird um, because they come out as derivatives. So it's an absorption technique in that you basically you apply a magnetic field. Um, to undergo a Zeeman splitting of your MSFS sublevels, just like you would undergo a Zeeman splitting of your M sub I sublevels for NMR. Okay. Um, and then what you're going to do, it depends upon the geometry of the instrument, but they're generally set up in what's called a perpendicular mode. Um, so that you need a delta uh, M sub S of, of one transition. So, for example, minus one half to plus one half for your M sub S's, and that would be allowed. Uh, and then, of course, the energies of those transitions are generally in the microwave region. Okay. So traditional X-band EPR, you're talking about a third of a wave or something. Um, and so, um, um, obviously, you can't have M sub S of zero, right? So you can't have a diamagnet because there will be no Zeeman splitting and no transition. Uh, but unfortunately, if you have M sub S's that are integer spins, like, let's say, a, a total spin of two for high spin iron two, you tend to have something that's called rhombic zero field splitting. We won't get into it, but basically there's a, a splitting of the M sub S levels even before you turn on the magnet that's bigger mm. than your microwave energy. And so therefore you can't get a transition no matter how hard you try. You could go to a higher field instrument, but that's not something that most people have. So okay. you basically, the way it works is the microwave frequency is fixed. You scan the magnetic field until you, you have a splitting that matches your microwave frequency and then you get an absorption. But for reasons I won't get into dealing with sensitivity and, and just the electronics uh, of the instrumentation, uh, basically it gets processed as a derivative. So okay. an EPR spectrum is actually just the derivative of an absorption spectrum. So if you integrated it once, you would get an absorption spectrum. So that's why they, they tend to look a little weird. Um, okay. Yeah. I, uh, I guess this is because this is probably, so, I mean, I'll probably have to learn about EPR um, eventually. Um, if I continue with my, um, my iron uh, catalysis. So is there like a source? I mean, is this just years of experience you kind of talk? I mean, obviously you've done many EPR experiments, but like, is there like a, a source that you recommend to learn about EPR? Or is it more so just the more you do it, you know? It's, well, there, there are two aspects to it. The theoretical side, right? Just how it works, theoretical spectra, uh, physical contributions like zero field splitting, hyperfine coupling, super hyperfine couplings. Um, there's going to be several good texts on that, right? Sure. Um, I think the harder thing to learn is more the practical stuff, right? Yeah. And that's often, well, you know, how do I prepare the samples? What concentrations do I need? Um, how do I make sure I don't power saturate my sample? Um, how do I know what, you know, doing spin integration is really important. Um, I think one of the, you know, most challenging things in EPR is it's a very sensitive technique. You can get signals for half a percent of all of your iron. No, oh, geez. But you know that it's half a percent of all of your iron. So you have to do, if you do proper spin integration, sometimes with zero field splitting um, corrections, um, you can get a better sense of, you know, how much am I looking at. Um, the temperatures you have to run is important because of spin relaxation. So for iron, generally you want to be cold, certainly for iron three. Um, so the best thing you can do for that is just reach out and ask people. I, I think, you know, there's lots of people in the community who do EPR of iron. Um, I'd like to think we're a pretty friendly bunch. So, um, you know, as you're doing something new, you know, ask questions. We've hosted lots of people in my group over the years um, to try to help to train them up as well um, for these types of techniques. Yeah, I definitely will keep this in mind <laughs> once I get to a point where to learn about EPR because it seems like a daunting task. I don't even, I don't even know if we have one on at, at the uh, university's campus here at Houston. I don't even know if we have one. I'll have to ask about that. Um, but well, I'm guessing you have one. I'm sure we do somewhere. Um, um, so there's EPR. So that's one way you could study, especially in the in the systems. And then the other one I think is MOSFET spectroscopy. Um, so did you I mean, use I should be specific. EPR is not iron specific, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. It's really true. just studying unpaired uh, electrons. So you can do cobalt, 
Yeah. You can do nickel, you can do other metals. Uh, moss power is element specific. Mm. And so your moss power spectrometer is also an absorption method, but it's a nuclear absorption. So basically we're all used to the fact that you have in an absorption spectrum, uh, an electronic ground state, electronic excited state, right? You excite it with light and you do a, a D to D transition, let's say between those two uh, states. And that'll be a, I don't know, 10,000 wave numbers, something like that. Um, there's also nuclear ground states and nuclear excited states. And so iron 57, we can probe the transitions between the nuclear ground and excited states, uh, which are, are sensitive to the local electronic environment around the iron. Um, there, you know, these are really small energy shifts. So generally you're dealing with a, a transition that's, you know, you know, 14,000 plus electron volts. So it's a very high energy transition. And you're looking at energy differences that are on the order of, you know, um, you know, fractions of, of, of a wave. Um, and so, uh, but it's iron specific. And so the nice mm. thing is it doesn't care if it's paramagnetic iron, diamagnetic iron, binuclear iron, mononuclear iron. It is a tremendous for us primary screening technique to say, okay, how many different irons are in our sample? What are their approximate ratios? Um, how does that change as we change conditions? And so to, to do that, we have to be able to run frozen solutions or solids. Otherwise you have too much of a recoil effect. And so we need to be able to make frozen solutions of highly air sensitive reaction samples. And so we do that in our glove boxes with, we have direct liquid nitrogen feeds into our glove boxes we've designed. So we always have four liter hand doors of liquid nitrogen inside of our glove boxes. Wow. Um, and so we can make samples, whether they be EPR, Ausbauer, MCD, and we can basically freeze them in the glove box. It's also very useful for um, freeze trapping very unstable intermediates and then, you know, trying to work them up at lower temperatures for crystallization as well. Did you have to get a custom glove box for that then? Like, I mean, have a ni liquid nitrogen, like how, like, I don't know, was that like easy to set up or? <laughs> um, it's, it's, um, it's not bad. So. The only custom thing is you need, uh, we have Embron boxes, so we have a KF40 fitting uh, through the top. Um, and so we basically build a, a custom feed-through inlet that just uh, connects to the box through there. Okay. Um, um, you know, there has to, it has a, a multi-valve system on it because we have to be able to purge it first to get all the air out. And you'd like it to cool down first so you're not just shoving all kinds of gas through your glove box. You also have to have a vent valve to deal with any you know, pressure buildup. But if you do it in a controlled fashion, it works tremendously well, actually. Um, um, and so we've had very good luck. Yeah, that's really, that's really cool. Um, so I assume you, obviously you've, you, you use both of these instruments a lot um, in your studies. And so um, in general, I'm, I'm very excited to see, uh, you know, um, what more there is to come with this, with these iron uh, couplings. Um, I also want to touch on, um, uh, I kind of want to shift now into um, your F element because um, uh, I'm a, I generally know nothing. So like, I'm, I'm uh, I'll kind of let you take a, I'll kind of let you take the reins here on like, you know, what particularly you're interested in um, with these F elements. And I know you got to do like um, electronic structure characterizations, uh, but you know, you know, what particularly interested you in these, in these compounds um, and these metals? Well, I think what interested me at first was just very fundamental, almost textbook type chemistry, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever we think we know of, of the transition metals, we know almost nothing by comparison about, about F-block systems. And so they have very complicated electronic structures. Um, you have, you know, the whole question of F orbital versus D orbital participation in bonding. Oh boy. How much valency <laughs> is there? Um, and so uh, as, as a spectroscopist, right, particularly someone who does a lot of magneto-optical spectroscopy, these are fascinating systems to look at. The F elements are often paramagnetic as well, um, particularly things like uranium-5 is a really nice system to look at. But I think as we got into it more, uh, I would say my interests have, have switched more towards their, their transformational chemistry. And so, you know, as we try to better understand electronic structure and bonding in those systems, you know, motivated by things like separations for nuclear waste and things like that, I think, it, it, you know, for me, what I find is that most of the chemistry that's done is on, you know, 
air and, and temperature rock stable type of compounds that are very easy to, to make. But if we really want to understand their chemi chemistry in full, we also have to be able to understand their transformational and reactive chemistry, mm. right? How they, how they can get from A to B, what are the reaction pathways that they take, right? Whether that be for, for bond activation, there's, of course, there's a lot of interest in N2 reduction, but um, so we're very interested in, in transient reactive, um, uh, particularly uranium complexes, and how how they carry out, let's say, bond activations using both maybe F and D orbitals compared to how a transition metal. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, that's still a pretty new area in F element chemistry. It's not, you know, it's not as, as well understood. You normally don't start off by trying to you know, trap the really unstable compounds, but you know, we've looked at things like, you know, what kind of compounds you form in reactions with Grignard reagents and making all kinds of uranium, homoleptic uranium methyls and phenyls compounds that people have tried to make for decades. Um, and, and, you know, they're very, very fun compounds and they're very different than their iron analogs. Um, but now we've been doing a lot more work on things like, you know, um, 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 Various types of, let's say, bond activation processes with yeah. reduced complexes um, and things like that, and, and just kind of trying to push the envelope of our knowledge of what can, you can do with those and, and, and how they actually uh, react. And it's still very, very. It's nice to be able to work sometimes in an area where you, you know you alluded to funding before. Where funding is, well, it's a new area. We don't understand it. There's lots of fundamental chemistry to learn here, and that's okay. That's kind yeah. of a refreshing thought in modern chemical research, that it's okay to do research um, to learn new things without having an end product in mind. And so that's something I find refreshing about, about work in, 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 in actinides. Obviously, there, there is impact there for nuclear separations, nuclear energy, but there's a lot of really cool fundamental work yet. Uh, to be determined. I think. Yeah, I think, yeah, you, you definitely said it. I mean, it's almost like back to form, just a fundamental understanding. I'm sure it's very like, there's like, there's like almost like no pressure really. It's just like, let's just take these compounds and let's understand their structure. And I think that's, you know, that's su super, that's gotta be super fun for you guys. Um, you know, I know you guys um, were looking at like ligand and the electronic structure effects of say like uranium three, uranium f uh, six four and all the oxidation states of uranium if you believe in oxidation states but um all you know, formal, how do you all the yeah, formal oxidations yeah uh you know how do you kind of um frame that let's say to a graduate student who's coming in i mean like you know like um like what you know what kind of makes this attractive but also you know as someone like i don't listen again i don't know anything about uranium chemistry so like how, I mean, is this stuff really hazardous? Like, I don't really know, like, what, is organic uranium complexes hazardous at all? Like, I, I have no idea. Well, I mean, um, I mean, all chemicals are hazardous, right? That's and true. So, so when we're working with uranium, we're, we're working with depleted uranium. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, that has a, a much, much lower uh, radioactivity or specific activity than, than even natural uranium that you mine out of the ground. And so that helps. Um, you know, you're dealing with a material where the biggest risk is ingestion, right? Um, and so for us, we tend to work with them predominantly in glove boxes. Uh, you know, there's lots of um, special procedures you want to follow. And in some ways, I tell the students it's actually easier to work with because if we're working with an organolithium compound, which is probably more dangerous, yeah. Um, if we spill some in the glove box, well, it, you know, good luck. Whereas if we're working with depleted uranium, when we're done with an experiment, we can take swipe tests. We can figure out, did we clean this all up properly? Is it all gone? Mm -hmm. Right? Have we, have we done this correctly? And so in some ways, even though there are more steps to go through in working with it, um, you can do it in a way that is incredibly safe. Um, and I, I think in some ways safer than, than how we deal with many chemicals. So I get much more nervous for reactions with organolithium um, than I ever would with depleted uranium in the room. Um, um, yeah, so I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, you've got to be careful, but I, I think that the risks are, are very much um, not out of line from what we deal with daily in the chemistry. 
And so in your work so far, any like uh, takeaways? I know you, you know, I know you really, I know you like one of your most recent ones is, is, uh, you know, electronic structure and bonding of your name three. Um, and, you know, you were doing MCD and like EPRs um, as well, computational studies. Um, so actually, I, I, um, I guess there's a twofold question. One is general, um, you know, general learning so far, you know, what are some of the takeaways? And two is to computationally, I mean, I, I've never had to do computational studies of, of, of F block elements. I mean, are they any harder than let's say studying like typical transition metals and organo, organos, um, organic elements, or is there, you have to use like a special, um, so what I will say on the DFT is we've, we've been very, so for, for transition metal compounds, even open shell transition metal compounds, we'll do our own DFT in our group. For F elements, I've been more than happy to work with a fantastic collaborator at Buffalo named Jochen Auschba, who's an expert in those calculations. They are more challenging. There's a yeah. lot more electrons you're dealing with um, in those heavy element systems. You often have to deal explicitly with spin orbit effects. Um, and so they are, they are, I think, at least to me, they are much more challenging uh, calculations. And so you, you tend to see in the field people that have uh, specific expertise in that area, yeah. um, like Laurent Moron in France, for example, um, doing a lot of those calculations. So we're, we're more than happy to pass those on to someone who does that for a living. Um, I can only imagine the, uh, like, I mean, the amount of electrons that are available, I mean, in those F block orbitals, like I can only imagine how complicated that, that may be and how, um, how taxing the calculations must be. I have, I have no idea. Um, yeah. But, but, but yeah, I mean, one of our big areas we've been working on is, is developing techniques like C term magnetic circular dichroism for F elements. That's, <laughs> it's not a technique that's been used a lot historically. Um, you know, um, some of the early work was actually done here at Oxford back in the eighties, uh, with Neptunium compounds. Um, but you know, it's a technique, um, as I mentioned before, which appeals a lot on things like spin orbit effects, uh, which are dominant in metals of the actinide series. So it's, in many ways, it's a, a really ideal technique for looking at electronic structure. And actinides. And so we've just been trying to systematically for the last few years build up our understanding of, of the types of spectra we're going to get as a function of oxidation state, geometry, ligation changes, working with people like Jochen for developing theoretical methods to, to calculate the MCD spectra themselves in these systems um, with the goal of them being able to use that moving forward for characterizing, you know, uh, species in solution, transient species. And so there's been a lot of very uh, fundamental work for the last few years, just building up our understanding of that technique and its application to uranium compounds. And I think now we're finally getting to the point where we can have some fun with it and, and start to look at some, some really interesting um, chemical questions. Yeah. Well, Professor Nadi, I'm extremely uh, excited to see, you know, what comes out of your uh, your lab over the next few few months. And I uh, would like to thank you for coming onto the podcast. It was extremely fun talking to you today and picking your brain about F-block elements, but also something that I'm personally really passionate about, which is, uh, you know, base metal catalysis and specifically iron. And so it was really fun to hear from you in the, on the inorganic spectroscopy side. And, um, I'm, you know, I'm excited to see the work that you have coming next at Oxford. Yeah, well, it was great uh, being able to talk with you today. I, you know, this is a fantastic uh, podcast series that you have going on. And, um, you know, I wish you the best of luck in your endeavors and, and adventures with iron in your PhD. I'll certainly be reaching out if I have questions about these things is, uh, this is definitely something right up our, our alley here. Um, you know, my, my advisor, Brad Caro is definitely one for mechanisms. And this is something that we've, um, really would like to know about. And so, um, I definitely will, I'm sure you'll hear from me <laughs> very, uh, very soon about these kind of questions, but thank you again. And, uh, you know, we'll see you on the next episode.